Thank you very much. It's a big pleasure to talk to you uh, this morning about the efficacy, effectiveness, and cost effectiveness of endoscopic uh, screening methods. Yeah. Well, um, of course, we would like to have results of uh, large-scale randomized trials to answer uh, these questions uh, uh, in the best way. There are, as most of you know, um, ongoing large-scale uh, trials on uh, SIG modoscopy um, at the moment in uh, different countries, uh, the UK, uh, Italy, Norway, and uh, the US. They have been initiated more than uh, 10 years ago. Uh, they include 10, 000, tens of uh, thousands of uh, participants. Uh, and uh, we are all, uh, uh, of course, anxiously waiting to see the results regarding um, reductions in uh, incidence and uh, mortality. However, even without having uh, these results uh, for the moment, uh, there is quite substantial evidence from epidemiological studies um, on uh, the uh, efficacy of uh, endoscopic screening methods. Most of this evidence uh, refers to uh, SIG motoscopy, but th there's also some evidence for colonoscopy. Most of the studies come from the United States, but there are also a few studies from uh, European countries. These have been essentially um, observational epidemiological uh, studies. But uh, despite uh, the large variety in uh, design and uh, uh, countries where uh, they have been carried out, there's uh, some um, consistent finding that um, well, our best estimates we uh, can make on a potential risk reduction uh, for both incidence and mortality for those who actually would uh, attend uh, an endoscopic uh, screening uh, would be uh, somewhere uh, between uh, 60 and 90 uh, percent. Well, uh, in a summary or a review paper uh, published uh, last year in the American Journal of Preventive uh, uh, medicine. Uh, colleagues from uh, the, the United States uh, tried to summarize uh, the evidence uh, from uh, these uh, studies and uh, uh, well, uh, based on some uh, selection they used uh, four studies to come up with an estimate uh, for uh, colonoscopy and seven for a uh, sigmoidoscopy and uh, their summary estimate was that uh, uh, the efficacy would be about 70% for colonoscopy, 50% for a sigmoidoscopy. That would mean uh, the reduction uh, or the potential reduction in incidence and mortality of those who actually participate in uh, the screening compared to about uh, 38%, which is very similar to the figures uh, that we have just seen in the uh, previous um, report uh, for um, the fecal occult uh, blood test. Then, of course, um, uh, it's very important uh, for the effectiveness on the population level to look at um, the uh, adherence to the tests. And uh, these uh, colleagues um, in their review estimated that under optimal conditions, and I all, uh, also think that is quite consistent with the data we have seen before, uh, it should be possible to achieve 60% uh, adherence uh, with uh, uh, the programs. And they um, estimated that uh, well, under optimal conditions, uh, this uh, level of adherence uh, could be achieved for all of uh, these uh, measures. And uh, if one then uh, translates uh, that into a, a potential effectiveness of the various programs, we come up with uh, estimates of uh, about or even more than 40% for colonoscopy, 30% for sigmoidoscopy, and 23% uh, for the fecal um, occult uh, blood test. Now uh, let us come to uh, cost effectiveness, um, very important of course for implementation or uh, for uh, political decisions to implement uh, screening measures. Um, one commonly used measure to um, uh, estimate cost effectiveness is uh, well to take uh, the difference of the costs of prevention uh, minus uh, the costs uh, averted um, uh, uh, per uh, quality adjusted life year saved and uh, in uh, this review, uh, there have been summary estimates um, uh, that you can see here. Uh, so it would be uh, about, um, well, this is, uh, these are US figures, and so uh, it, uh, the results are also given in US dollars. It would be uh, uh, about $9,000 uh, per quality adjusted life year saved for colonoscopy, um, 18000 for sigmoidoscopy, and about 13000 for um, FOBT. Um, these figures overall um, actually um, uh, compare quite favorably uh, with uh, results for other preventive uh, measures. 
Um, and uh, of course, this has not been the only cost-effectiveness studies. Uh, there has been a whole range of uh, such studies, mainly from the U.S. and a few from other countries. But uh, the common findings, in uh, essentially in all of them, uh, were that well, uh, whatever um, assumptions um, you make, um, uh, all of the the existing uh, screening methods, uh, FOBT, sigmoidoscopy, or colonoscopy, are uh, to be considered as cost-effective if we compare it to other. Uh, preventive measures, um, and uh, they are also uh, cost effective, uh, relatively more cost effective uh, than uh, many other uh, commonly accepted um, uh, screening or prevention measures, uh, including, uh, for example, uh, mammography. Um, there's some consensus uh, that uh, at the moment, no single optimal strategy with respect to uh, cost effectiveness can be uh, determined. And also, there's uh, uh, no definite um, uh, data about uh, what would be the optimal age limits and uh, screening intervals uh, for uh, screening programs. If we look at the, the existing um, cost effectiveness uh, studies uh, so far, uh, we also can see that uh, the, um, they are usually model calculations. They are based on uh, specific assumptions. And uh, well, uh, the assumptions commonly made uh, in these studies were the following. For sigmoidoscopy, it was assumed that uh, five-year uh, screening intervals uh, were uh, used. For colonoscopy, a 10-year screening intervals. This is uh, consistent with uh, the recommendations of most of the professional um, associations. Um, the also a common assumption is that uh, surveillance intervals after polypectomy would be uh, three years, uh, and it was assumed that the same risk reduction uh, for proximal and uh, distal uh, colorectal cancer could be um, uh, achieved uh, for those uh, uh, parts of the uh, co uh, colon that are actually um, uh, looked at uh, with the respective uh, method. Uh, and finally, um, uh, it was assumed that uh, there are identical schedules uh, for a screening for women and men. However, it seems from epidemiological evidence uh, that uh, there is further potential to enhance the cost effectiveness of uh, endoscopic uh, screening. And some approaches are listed here. We um, uh, could think about uh, optimization of the screening intervals, uh, of the surveillance intervals. And uh, also, I think we uh, should address the question whether we could be more uh, cost effective by a better risk adaptation of our screening offers uh, actually to uh, the risk of uh, the uh, screenees. Um, and I'll try to show you uh, some evidence from uh, recent epidemiological studies that uh, might be uh, helpful in that uh, respect. Uh, one of uh, the studies is uh, the so-called uh, DAX study. Uh, DAX is uh, 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 from the German title. Uh, it's a study uh, called Darmkrebschancen der Verhütung durch Screening uh, that we are um, conducting uh, in Heidelberg in Germany at, at the moment. It's a population-based case control study um, conducted in southwest uh, Germany. Overall, 22 uh, clinics um, in the Rhein-Neckar area are involved. We are recruiting patients from these clinics and uh, controls from population registries. Um, in contrast to other, many other studies, uh, we uh, explicitly did not um, uh, choose to take an upper um, age limit uh, there. Uh, meanwhile, we have uh, recruited uh, more than 1,600 cases and um, almost uh, 2,000 uh, controls. Um, uh, I'll show you uh, the previously um, uh, published results, which uh, refer to uh, uh, the first uh, uh, 600 patients and uh, controls uh, of uh, these patients, but, but we hope to have uh, more detailed results uh, by the end of this year. Um, we first asked uh, the question, well, when does a colonoscopy have uh, to be uh, repeated among those who have uh, negative results in a first um, um, colonoscopy? And to address this question, uh, we looked at the risk of, or at the relative risk of uh, developing colorectal cancer among um, uh, people uh, who had a negative uh, colonoscopy uh, at various time intervals um, after um, uh, or after various time intervals um, after negative colonoscopy. And we took a, as a reference group uh, those people who never went to any um, colonoscopy. And these would be the people that usually would be recommended uh, to uh, do some uh, screening test. 
And the interesting result here is that well, uh, what we expected uh, within, let's say, up to 10 years following such a negative colonoscopy, the risk is very low. The relative risk here around uh, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.25. That means this is uh, the, the risk of these people is uh, about uh, 75, 80 percent lower uh, than uh, the risk of uh, people who never had been uh, to any uh, colonoscopy. Uh, so, uh, and there's common agreement uh, that, uh, well, in this time interval, a repeat colonoscopy would usually not be necessary. However, in our study, we found that even those people who had a negative colonoscopy 10 to 19 years ago, they, they still had a very, very low um, and uh, significantly uh, reduced uh, risk of uh, colorectal cancer, uh, point zero, uh, zero point three three. Uh, and uh, even uh, if uh, a negative colonoscopy uh, was uh, 20 or, or, or more years ago, uh, the risk was uh, still uh, quite low, although this risk reduction was no longer uh, statistically significant here, um, which may be due to uh, limited um, case numbers. We then uh, looked at this uh, data in uh, a little bit more detail and found uh, the following. As I said, uh, we had included uh, patients of all ages, but uh, is, uh, usually screening is recommended uh, for this age group here, um, uh, first screening 55 to 64 years, and we look at uh, uh, the risk of uh, colorectal cancer after negative colonoscopy at that age uh, in the long term, it's particularly low uh, for this group, which further supports uh, uh, well, uh, potential uh, suggestions that uh, it's not really necessary to repeat such a, a colonoscopy uh, within uh, 10 or even uh, 20 years. Well, another important question is, um, now, uh, when to schedule surveillance colonoscopy after positive finding, uh, when polyps uh, adenomas have been uh, detected and uh, removed? We took a very similar approach to address uh, this question uh, in our study, and uh, now we looked at the risk of colorectal cancer uh, within, um, sorry, uh, within various time intervals um, after uh, a a colonoscopy with a polypectomy, and again, we took those patients or those people with no previous colonoscopy as uh, a reference group. And what we saw here is that, uh, again, as uh, expected from previous knowledge, about within one or two years uh, following um, polypectomy, the risk is very, very low, uh, significantly reduced to 0 0.25 here, the relative risk. Um, but uh, the interesting finding here is it's also uh, still very low in the time window three to five years uh, after a polypectomy, and only uh, after six or, or more years uh, uh, we have uh, this increased risk again um, in uh, this group. So uh, this data would support uh, suggestions that, well, for screen screening intervals might possibly uh, be, uh, uh, or surveillance intervals might possibly be extended to uh, five years. Of course, um, there are differences in the types of adenomas that are detected, and we made a, a, a further distinction be, uh, between uh, well, a group of high-risk polyps and uh, other polyps. But e uh, even within the group of people with high-risk polyps, the risk within up to five years following um, a polypectomy was very low, significantly reduced uh, relative risk of uh, 0 0.27. Uh, it was a little bit higher than in those with uh, the lower risk uh, polyps, but uh, even for most of these people with the uh, so called high risk polyps, five years might actually be uh, sufficient. So, what do these uh, data suggest? Um, I think they uh, provide uh, uh, evidence that uh, screening intervals might be extended, possibly to uh, 20 years. Even a once-only screening in endoscopy of uh, people uh, doing having their first screening at, say, age 55 or 60 uh, might be uh, useful and might actually be uh, quite cost-effective. Um, the surveillance intervals might possibly be extended to five years, and this is what our American colleagues re recommended in, a, in their latest uh, recommendation um, uh, that was given out uh, uh, last year. Um, well, and uh, of course, the extension of these intervals would have at least uh, two uh, effects. Of it could uh, uh, increase, enhance the cost effectiveness of endoscopic scre screening, but I think it could also uh, increase uh, the uh, compliance, if you can uh, tell people, well, uh, a once-only um, 
colonoscopy would be sufficient for um, most of, of the people. Uh, this uh, uh, might be an additional incentive or encouragement for um, people to take such an examination. Well, um, let me briefly come to uh, a potential to uh, increase cost effectiveness by a better uh, adaptation of our screening offers to the risk of uh, people. Here's uh, uh, some data from our uh, esteemed uh, colleague, uh, Jaroslav Regula, who is, uh, I think, here in the room uh, this morning, uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, last year, uh, where um, in a large colonoscopy uh, uh, study from Poland, uh, including uh, about 50,000 participants, um, the number uh, needed to screen to, uh, to detect an advanced uh, neoplasia uh, was uh, estimated for four groups, um, uh, first of all, uh, men and women, and then this was, uh, was split up by whether there was a, a family history uh, in uh, those people or, um, well, these are just the overall results here. And uh, well, very roughly speaking, in a cost-effective um, screening program, the number needed to screen to uh, detect such a neoplasia should be uh, uh, quite low. And looking at uh, these uh, numbers, uh, we see, uh, first of all, that well, what I think is uh, well known and accepted, that uh, these numbers needed to screen both for men but also for women uh, are lower um, for those with a family history of um, um, colorectal cancer, so special offers should be made to this group. But what we also see is uh, that uh, within uh, each group, uh, the numbers needed to screen are uh, considerably lower among men compared to women, so both overall and uh, within the group of people with uh, family history. Uh, so um, uh, or one could think about different screening offers for men and women. And if you look at this data, the number needed to, uh, to screen, for example, here in the overall group for men at age 40 to 49 is uh, about the same as we have uh, for women only uh, uh, at age 55 to uh, 59. So that makes an uh, almost 10 years age difference that uh, um, and a similar difference we uh, see here in those with the family history. So I think it's really worth thinking about having different ages for when to initiate and uh, carry out screening for uh, women and men. And uh, we looked at uh, this issue further uh, now uh, in uh, incidence and mortality data for colorectal cancer. Um, these are first uh, data from uh, the United States where you see the 10-year the cur cumulative incidence of colorectal cancer by age, which is, uh, of course, going up for both men and for women. At each single age, it's higher for men than for women. But you also can look at these data in a uh, horizontal manner, if you wish. And uh, if you look at the risk um, that uh, the 10-year cumulative incidence that men reach at the age of uh, 50, we see that it's only about five years later that uh, women have the same risk. Uh, if you start screening, let's say, at age 55, uh, also the risk uh, of men is, uh, at age 55 is only reached about five years later by women, and uh, the same would be true if you uh, would start screening at, uh, let's say, age uh, 60. Um, so these are uh, incidence uh, data, but uh, the data are very similar for um, mortality. Uh, again, a difference of uh, five to or even more than five years uh, between um, men and uh, women. Uh, well, uh, these are U.S. data, as I said. Uh, uh, is this a U.S. phenomenon? No, it is not. It's a global phenomenon uh, here. We collected data from various um, developed countries uh, and large countries from uh, all over the world. And uh, uh, we always uh, looked at uh, when women reach the mortality levels of men uh, uh, aged 50, uh, 55, or uh, 60. And we see that it's, well, uh, about five years later uh, here for uh, age 50. It's about uh, five to even. 10 years later if one would start a screening at age 55 or um, age uh, 60. So what, um, or if we compare these data now to uh, actually what we are doing right now, we uh, almost everywhere we are offering um, a screening at the same age for wi uh, women and men. But uh, in addition, and these are data now from the German um, colonoscopy program uh, for uh, 
2003, we see that uh, in all these age groups, women participate much more than uh, men. So uh, our offer or uh, what, what we do in screening is uh, not very well adapted uh, to uh, actual risk. And cost effectiveness could certainly be um, optimized by taking these patterns into account. So let me come to uh, the summary and uh, conclusions. Um, Endoscopic screening for colorectal cancer is, uh, clearly has a very high efficacy um, if offered at high levels of quality. I think this is an uh, important uh, precondition to mention uh, always. Uh, it can have a high effectiveness uh, if uh, we achieve um, high population coverage. It has been consistently found to be uh, cost effective in uh, multiple uh, studies. The cost effectiveness may be further enhanced by optimization of screening or, uh, and uh, surveillance <coughs> intervals and by better adaptation of screening offers to individual risks, uh, for example, of uh, taking family history and uh, gender into account. Well, there's no question that it would be a very a powerful tool to reduce the burden of colorectal cancer and uh, uh, starting from about 400,000 cases and uh, 200,000 deaths uh, in Europe uh, per year. Uh, it, uh, we could roughly estimate that under uh, uh, well, optimal conditions, uh, it would be possible to save uh, 160,000 cases and uh, 80,000 deaths each year in Europe. Thank you very much.